It's always a joy when God brings to us men and women that he has anointed to give us a word. And one of the individuals that I love deeply and I appreciate his ministry, I preached in his church there in Louisiana a number of times. He's a man who, when you just get around him, you get encouraged. He has that gift. Everything's exciting to him, and it's wonderful. We need people like that, full of faith. He, was, he led his uh, college team to a national championship. His quarterback was, was, uh, was a professional football player, quarterback. And uh, God spoke to him to give it all up and help his dad as an assistant pastor in the church in Shreveport, Louisiana. Now, you've got to be a man of God willing to do that. But he did. And... Um, Today he pastors that church, and he's just turned it over to his son. So now we can have him come and holler at us more and more. Amen. <laughs> Would you welcome Pastor Denny Duran as he comes to meet us today. Wow, it's so good to be here. You know, I, I, I'll just say it. It's good to be home because that's the way you make me feel every time I'm here. I feel like I'm back home. And uh, this, this place just gets all over me. Um, I've been sitting down there. You're not supposed to text in church, but I, I've been sending pictures of the prayer meeting this morning and, and uh, comments and, and snapshots to my family. We have a family thread. So I've just been bragging on you all morning because of what God is doing in this place. Your pastors, this dynamic duo, I'm telling you, don't you understand you've got the best leadership on the planet? Hallelujah. I love every time I get a chance to come and just experience the miracle that is Kings Maui and Kings Maui and the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen. This morning, I want to share with you a message that God's put on my heart for the church at large. In fact, I feel that God has moved me by His Holy Spirit to give this word everywhere I go this year. We are in a very crucial time of church history. And the enemy has tried many, many ways with many advanced evil spiritual strategies to displace the people of God. And we have got to make it clear to the enemy we're not falling for it. I want to speak to you on the subject today, the glory of the gathering. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will speak to our hearts strongly, powerfully, with such love, I pray that you will speak to us and you will draw us to a new place. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you'll turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Hebrews 10, 23. Hebrews 10, 23. This is what the Word of God says. Let us, somebody say us. You see, the Lord is always speaking not just to me, but He's speaking to us. When the disciples asked him, how should we pray? He said, pray this way. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So the scripture here says, let us hold fast to the confession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promise. And let us 
consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as we see the day approaching. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. Would you right now just say that with me, those three words? The assembling of ourselves. One more time. Assembling of ourselves. What we have here is a warning for those who live in the last days. And the warning is very clear. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You know, when the government's COVID mandates shut down our gatherings as the church, it was a very strange season, wasn't it? We as pastors tried to stay as positive as we could. We hadn't faced anything like this. And frankly, we didn't know what to do. We talked to our comrades uh, uh, in other churches and other places, and we all said basically the same thing. Well, thank God the money has stayed solid. Well, our online crowd really is tremendous when you look at the numbers. Uh, well, the people are getting church even if it's not in the building. But that last statement that we made is inaccurate. People online are not getting church. They are getting a service. They are getting worship. But they are not getting church. There is a vast difference between church and the information that is given in church. Now, I'm going to say some controversial things here. So don't anybody leave till you get to the explanation. Let me explain. Church is not just hearing preaching. It's not just being blessed by worship. It's not just sending our tithe. Church refers to the body of Christ, and it's about the mystical manifest glory of the gathering. It is the regular reunion of believers. It is the weekly celebration of the community of God. Viewing church is not having church. Attending church is having church. Even now at the bridge and the other sites that are online, there are gatherings. There's not a live preacher there. This is just fine. But there is a gathering. They're having church because the gathering of the people of God is church. Now, our hearts go out to everyone who's a shut-in or in hospitals or in prisons or working out of town or out of the, out of the country. For those of you that are overseas serving the military, God bless you. Thank God you can get the church feeling of the pastor preaching and the worship and all that goes on here. And we pray for the time when you will be able to be back in church. But ladies and gentlemen, church is the gathering and the gathering is glorious. You have to understand, even though we have modern technology to get the message of the church to the four corners of the earth, the message of the church, though vital, is not all there is to the church. And you know, some are going to say, well, pastor, you know, are you saying the building is the church? It's not what I'm saying at all. You'll say, pastor, you, you have to understand, people in China meet in houses. In Africa, they meet in tents are out in the open places in Arab countries, often in secluded, secret desert places. In Afghanistan, the church meets in caves. My response is, exactly. 
but the gathering is happening in all those places. The building is not the church, but ladies and gentlemen, the gathering is. Now, I know in the aftermath of COVID, we've been left with a very different paradigm of church attendance, but we must understand there is a glory in the gathering of the Lord's church that cannot be known anywhere else in the human experience. You see, first of all, the gathering is glorious because it satisfies the soul. Do you know that it's your soul that longs for the satisfaction of comfort and assurance and self-actualization? It is your soul, the Word of God says, that experiences the emotions of life. According to the Bible, the soul can get thirsty and hungry. Psalm 107 and 9 says, He has satisfied the thirsty soul. The hungry soul, he is filled with what is good. The soul can become bound and restricted. Psalm 142 and 7, Bring my soul out of prison so that I may give thanks to your name. Our souls can become weary. Proverbs 25 and 25 says, Good news is like cold water to a weary soul. 1 Peter 1.22 says the purifying or the detox of the soul actually happens when we have a new love for the brethren, which is the gathering. This is what it says. Listen. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Psalm 84 and 2 says this, My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. You know, according to the Barner Research Group, 32% of Christians in America have stopped attending church altogether post-COVID. 32% just didn't come back. You don't have to use your calculator to figure that according to these calculations, a church of 1,000 now has an attendance of 680. A church of 10,000 now has been reduced by over 3,000 attenders. Barna's research also shows that a clear majority of those surveyed that have returned to regular church attendance, that is those that have gone back to church, number one, are not as anxious about life as those who have stopped attending services. Secondly, the church attenders surveyed are more likely to say they have inner peace from God. Isn't that interesting? Number three, Christians that have stopped attending church are also more likely to be bored and anxious about life. You see, let me say this to you. You can stay home, you can just go to work, go to the gym, listen to the latest doomsday talk from the network anchors and political bloggers. You can check in with your gossip circle, fall in bed at the end of the day with a troubled and a tormented soul and wonder why. Or you can walk into the glory of this place. Stand beside brothers and sisters in Christ who struggle like you struggle. Who have needs, desires, and dreams just like you have. Who create glorious moments of worship together. And your soul will soar. Your soul will be satisfied. Because this is not a me religion that we have it is an our an us a we religion it is the body of Christ and this is the glory of the gathering can you right now just lift your hands and thank God for the glory of the gathering thank you Lord for the glory of the gathering you see the atmosphere in a church like this where God's family gathers is seasoned with years of worship and preaching. Now follow me. This atmosphere is seasoned with years and years of worship and preaching of the Word. I have a little French grandma. Uh, 
She's passed away many years ago, but I will never forget her and being in her presence. She's the reason why we are in church today, reason why my family is full of preachers of the gospel. Grandma Latchley, when she gave her life to Jesus, it was all in. I'll never forget, we gave her a great big Bible, one of those blue ribbon Bibles that people sell from door to door, at least they did in those days. And it's a Bible that you put on the communion table or at home you put in a special place and open it to one of the beautiful old paintings that is in the middle of the Bible, one of the prints. But her Bible was coming apart at the seams. And my dad asked her, Mom, what's happening to your Bible? She said, oh, Shaq, I beat that devil with that Bible. <laughs> I drive him out of my house with the Word of God. Well, my, my grandmother was also an amazing Cajun cook. And uh, when you took the skillet out of the cabinet, you notice that even though it had been cleaned, there was still some stuff on that skillet. There were hundreds of meals that had been cooked into that skillet. So you could cook a fried egg in your skillet and it's good. But if you cooked a fried egg in her skillet, that was the best fried egg you were ever going to eat. What I will tell you about this atmosphere is that there are some things that have been cooked into this atmosphere. You see, scientists are telling us that they are now making attempts through their technology to capture words and sentences and even speeches from the past. They, they actually think that they're going to be able one day to develop a technology that may capture the Gettysburg Address that's still out there in the atmosphere. Or even the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know about that. But if that is at all true, then this place is filled with millions of prayers of praise. This place is filled with thousands of preached messages and proclaimed truths. This place is filled with the exalting and praise of those that have been healed by the power of God and delivered by the Spirit of God. When you walk into this place, you are in an atmosphere of deliverance. You are in an atmosphere of faith. You are in an atmosphere of glory. This is a place where the enemy dare not show his face. He's outnumbered here because of the angels of God that make their way to hear your worship and to offer it to Almighty God. You see, folks, this is the place where your soul is restored. Hallelujah. When you attend the gathering, you are in an atmosphere that causes you to feel the very declarations of God that have been released in this place through the years. Now, here's the next thing. Not only is this gathering a place where your soul is restored but it is also glorious because it's God's plan the gathering is God's plan always has been King James Version this scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The gathering was God's plan from the beginning. The very first thing we see God saying to man and woman in Genesis 1.28 is be fruitful and multiply. He never wanted it to be about the few. He wanted it to be about the many. God never intended for our lives to be lived isolated and alone. 
He was a God not just of the person, but of the people from the very beginning. Even after his plan with Adam and Eve was hijacked by Satan's deception, God found it another way. He found his desire in the heart of another man of faith, a man that was willing to buy into his corporate vision of a people. God's first promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3 was this, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. Now may I make it clear that Abraham had never in his life had it occurred to him that he wanted to be a great nation or a great people. All he wanted was one boy. That's it. A progenitor of his name and of his heritage. But God's plan and God's desire was imposed on him. Abraham, I want to give you a great people. I want to make you a great nation. God's goal was not just to bless him, but to pass his DNA of faith to a family that would become a nation, that would become a people. Yes, that would one day become a church. Then, of course, there's Jacob, Ab Abraham's grandson, who had 12 sons who were the beginning of the 12 tribes of Israel, and God delighted in them. When the Israelites left Egypt after 400 years of captivity, they were at that moment a nation the family of God they weren't really a unified people yet in fact at one point Moses became so angry and upset he went to God and he said I give up and God shocked him by agreeing with him Moses said these people they're rebellious they're, they're stiff necked I'm, I'm done with them and God agrees with him and it shocks Moses God said I agree with you get out of the way I'm going to kill them all today. Of course, Moses said, well, no, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> Let's rethink this. Let's rethink this. I may have gotten a little carried away there. <laughs> but the last thing God said in that statement reveals the heart of God when it comes to the gathering. Because he said, move out of the way I'm going to destroy them all and then he looked at Moses and said and I'll make you a great nation see God's plan has always been the gathering always God loves every one of us he knows us by name he numbers each hair on our heads but in God's heart it has never been just about the individual you say, the Lord would have died for me if I was the only person on the earth. That is the sweetest thing I ever heard, but it's just not in the Bible. The Lord has always wanted the people. That's the desire of His heart. The plan of redemption revolves not around the one, but it revolves around the people of God. And David understood this. That's why in Israel today, he is still known as king of kings. He was a man after God's own heart because he loved God's people like God loved them. He was a shepherd to the people of God. And we have our first glimpse of David as a gatherer in 1 Samuel 22. David departed from there, escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all of his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone, listen, doesn't this sound like the church to you? Everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became a commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. When David finally took the throne... The strength of his kingdom was that he regularly met with people at the gate, which was like a large piazza, a large village square. And there would perhaps be thousands that would meet with him. And he would put his throne there in the gate because he was a man of the gathering. He understood it. Then there was Solomon. What did Solomon ask for? Instead of riches... And instead of fame and instead of conquest over his enemies, everyone here would lift their voice and say wisdom, right? That's not what he asked for. And that's not what moved God. 
Let's read it again. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and, and God asked, ask for whatever you want me to give you. And this is his response. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child, and I don't know how to carry out my duties. Notice verse 8's emphasis. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people. What? Give your servant wisdom to govern your people. Well, Pastor, wisdom's not the emphasis, is it? No. Wisdom was the tool. What he asked for, give me something to help you do what's on your heart, God. Because for you, it's always been about the gathering. It's always been about the people. Give me wisdom so that I can govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? At that point, he has God's heart completely. You see, God's favor fell heavily on Solomon because like his father, Solomon knew the key to God's heart was the gathering, his people. The prophets of God only had one focus, the future of the family of God. Someone said, well, let's go to the New Testament. Jesus didn't go to church. Have you ever read Luke 4, 16, where the Bible says he, Jesus, went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom? Now, the Bible says, that Jesus was constantly preparing his disciples for their mission. Do you know that everything Jesus was preparing his disciples for had to do with establishing the gathering? Do you know that there was no teaching to those men that did not have to do with the gathering, with their responsibility? To the people of God. Remember Peter's story? Peter denies the Lord, and then the Lord appears to him after his resurrection, and he goes right to the heart of the matter. Remember how Jesus went to the heart of the matter of that rich young ruler that day? Because he knew that his real problem was the fact that he loved money. You know that Jesus went to the heart of the matter with Peter because he knew that his real problem was that he didn't love people. If you love me, you're going to have to love my people. If you do anything with me, you're going to have to serve my people. Love my sheep. Love my lambs. You see, in America, we believe in democracy, and democracy is all about individual rights. That's what it's about. Individual rights. Democracy. I am free. Well, let me tell you something. When you come to Jesus, you have to understand there's never been a democracy in the Bible. It's a kingdom. There is a king, and he has a will and a way to do things, and he also has desires in his heart, and those desires are the only ones that matter. And you know what God wants for you is for you to be a part of the gathering because that's the only place that he's going to fulfill the plan and purpose for your life. I only have a few minutes. I am going fast, but we're not going to sacrifice anything because I'm going to tell you, God is going to speak to us about this moment and about this truth. Now, the gathering is glorious because God's favor and blessing is there. There is a blessing in this house. Here's what the Word of God says. Psalm 12. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Now, this is not a redundant passage. Listen to it again. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the house in the courts of our God. That's not saying the same thing. 
It's not saying those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the house of the Lord. No, it's speaking of two different locations. This is what it's saying. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord is a place on earth. It's a place on earth. That's here. You're here today. Shall flourish in the courts of God. That's a place in heaven. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord on earth shall flourish in the courts of heaven. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord are known in the courts of heaven. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall be heard in the courts of heaven. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord who have needs shall flourish and prosper in the courts of heaven. You said, you mean you believe that God keeps record of everybody every Sunday that is gathered with the people of God. Absolutely. Any more questions? Now, I've got one more thing to share. And uh, it's just very important that we understand. In fact, two more things. Just, just, just take me a second. But uh, we need, as the people of God, to understand the gathering right now is crucial and it's glorious because it's the only hope for the world. It, it, you know, everywhere you look, it looks so hopeless, doesn't it? The future of our economy looks hopeless. Our government assures us that they can print trillions of paperback bucks to be distributed like confetti at a Mardi Gras parade with no real logic or responsibility and absolutely no repercussions. But we know history. We know better. It just looks so hopeless. As we look at the future of our educational system, it looks so hopeless. Not only do students work for years to pay back student loans, the product of our state and many of our private institutions of higher learning is militantly anti-Christ, anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-morality, anti-tradition, anti-church, and anti-American. 90% of youth who are active in church drop out of church by their sophomore year in college. It looks so hopeless. 72% of college faculty members describe themselves as politically liberal. 70% of Christian youths who attend secular universities will completely abandon their faith. It just looks so hopeless. And as we look at the future of our nation, it looks so hopeless. We're divided racially, politically, ideologically. The chasm separating us seems to be growing every single day. A recent Washington Post headline says this, In America, talk turns to something not spoken of for 150 years, civil war. When our politicians, our so-called civilized, educated, compassionate leaders, vigorously campaign for confused men, to have the right to use women's and girls' restrooms even in junior high and high schools. When they campaign for full-term abortions, which means a baby could be murdered instead of delivered. When they campaign for our leaders justifying burning and looting and murder in our cities and now applaud mob stealing in broad daylight as some kind of demented payback. When they applaud paid insurrectionists, Antifa and others, they're not prosecuted, but are given a carte blanche invitation to burn down Main Street, USA. When our highest ranking officials refuse to speak in a word of reprimand or disapproval, it just looks so hopeless. But ladies and gentlemen, it's not hopeless because we are the hope of the world. We're here. The church is here. The church has always thrived in tough times. Sin persecution will grow. Sin pressure will explode. Sin anything you want. You can send us heaven's worst plans and strategies, but we are going to survive and thrive because greater is he that is in, not me, he that is in us, us, than he that is in the world. Amen. Now, the glory is gatherous. Is glor the gathering is glorious. It's not the glory is gatherous. It's the glory gather is glorious. Gathering is glorious because it is the body of Christ. Now, what does that mean? Body of Christ means that we are the bride of Christ. Let me just put it to you this way: We are His sweetheart. 
We are the apple of his eye. We are the pride and the joy of his heart as our creator, as our God, as our Lord, as our master. We are who he is watching moment by moment and watching over day by day. I can't even begin to tell you how precious you are to your father. You are precious to him. I uh, had a guy in my church that wanted to run for Congress. Shreveport is like a banana republic. I'm talking about Louisiana in particular. We've got, we have a list of our public officials and elected officials, as long as you're armed, that have spent time in prison, I'm telling you. And it's just as crooked as it can be, and the elections are that way a lot of the times. And so this guy really wanted to run. He really wanted to run. I said, okay, come on, get in the car. So we went down into a part of town where there was a gentleman that was a state senator, and he also ran a business. And so we went into his office, and I said, sir, I'd like for you to meet John Milkovich, who was the guy that was running. They exchanged greetings. And then I turned to the man, and I said, uh, is your wife here? I said, yes, she is. I said, well, could she come out? I'd just like to see her. She's such a lovely person. She's so wonderful. He said, oh, yes, I love my wife. He had a much younger wife, and he did love his wife. So she came out, and I said, ma'am, it's so good to see you. I said, how is your foundation for African children working out? I said, oh, it's just going great. I said, wonderful. I said, you know, we were so happy to contribute to that a while back and just glad it's doing great. So good to see you. And this is John Milkovich. And um, made sure he met her. I took the guy and put him in the car. And I said, okay, you want to run for public office in Louisiana? That's the gatekeeper that gets you elected. The check is 25000 if you want him to turn out the vote. Now, I've lived in Shreveport a long time. I know things. I said, but if you will send a $1,500 check to that woman's foundation, he won't oppose you because he really loves his wife. He really loves his bride. Sure enough, he went home, wrote a $1,500 check to African children. We pray that it got there. I don't know, but it didn't matter. The man didn't oppose him because he loved his bride. Here, here's what you have to understand about the offering today, and you've got to get this. The offering today is all about the Lord's bride. That's what this offering is about. You're going to do something that endears you to God because you are about, as a part of the Lord's bride, to recognize how much he loves his wife and how much he is moved when you do something for his bride. You are allowing his bride to grow and become more glorious in the earth. The offering you give today is going to be an offering that you bring, as large an offering as you can bring, by the way, to say, Lord, please watch. You say, you think the Lord watches the offering? I think if there's one thing God watches is that we have Scripture for that happens in a service, it's the offering because the only field trip Jesus ever took his disciples on was to the temple to watch the offering. He takes them to the, watch the offering and he says, wait, 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 now watch, watch this. Okay, you see the guy there? You look, look how much he's giving. And he gave a great, and then the next person came and it was a little widow and she gave, listen, he, she gave all she had. The Lord in that moment said three things to us. Number one is this, he watches the offering. That's one thing we get, we know for sure. Secondly, 
He knows what you're capable of giving. And then the third thing is he knows how much you gave. So <laughs> it's just right there. But in this generation at this time, when there is such a delineation between light and darkness, when it's so stark, the bride of Christ is something that we have got to have a revelation of. And we've got to understand that when we do something to build that bride, to bless that bride, to make that bride even more glorious, that not only will the Father make sure that His Son is honored by your being blessed, but He will make sure that you are capable of continuing to earn and to do all that you do that you might again and again and again bless His bride. Amen. I want you to bow your heads just for a moment. Shut yourselves away with God. I'm going to ask one question. How many of you right here will say, Pastor Denny, I'm really not where I should be with God, but I really know today what you've said makes sense. I'm ready to get back in church, and I'm ready to be a person who knows God in a personal and a real and a powerful way. You say, look, my heart, if you say, Pastor Denny, if you look at my heart, you would know that I have not been close to the Lord in a while, but you'll say, I want to be close to God. I want Jesus in my life. On the count of three, I want you to lift your hand. I'm not going to have you do anything but lift your hand, but I want you on the count of three. One, two, three. Lift your hand all over this place. I know that I've been away from God. Yes, hands all over. Everyone pray this prayer with me. Everyone pray this prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus, I give you my life in a fresh way today. I want to be a part of what you're doing in the earth. And I do not want the world to at all impact. I do not want the world to at all impact. Say it. My life and my commitment to you. So I throw off the things that I've been doing. The way that I've been thinking. And I turn in a fresh way to you. I give you my life today. Now, believers, all of this place, as your heads are bowed, you shut away the Lord and say, Lord, let me receive the word I've heard. I want to be back in church, understanding that is close and dear to your heart. And allow me right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Allow me right now by the power to understand how important giving to your bride is today. That it's important to you. That's important to and it's precious to you. That it's precious to you. A, as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, this is what I pray, Lord God, over your people. Whatever they were going to give, I pray they'll reconsider it. I pray that some of them will determine no. If the Lord is watching, if he knows what I'm capable of giving and he knows what I give, then I surely am going to double it or I'm going to triple it or I'm going to give the biggest offering that I have ever given on this Pentecost because I am going to please my Savior by blessing his bride. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you give praise to the Lord? What a word. Oh, come on. Let's praise the Lord. The ushers are going to come up and down the aisle, and we do have our final offering for victory offering we take on the Feast of Pentecost. My wife and I are... are uh, no, turn that. We're, we'll be receiving an offering tonight for our guests, but we're doing victory offering. And uh, one of the things that you want to do, this is very important, is do your very best. My wife and I will be giving the largest gift we've ever given at one time at, uh, on Pentecost, and we'll be giving 60000 and that's what we're doing. We're, I, I've, last time Pastor Denny was with us, we came to a banquet, and we were going to give a certain amount, and by the time he finished preaching, 
we had doubled what we were going to give. <laughs> and uh, so I just figured I'm going to give already a big amount. <laughs> How many know we all need to be encouraged to do big things for God? He's a great coach. Did you know his team, his high school team, has been national champions many years? And, uh, and it's a small school, but they play the big schools, and they were national champions. They were, they were number one school in America, football team. He's got a gift to encourage. I'm encouraged. So when you're ready to give, you can text to give, text victory. You can have an envelope, write out a check to KC. Just get up as we worship, lay it at the altar, and then we'll bring it to the Lord and we'll declare victory. Amen. Would you come if you're ready to give? Hallelujah. Sing, holy is the Lord, holy is the Lord Almighty, seated on the throne. He's seated on the throne of glory, high and lifted up. Your presence fills the temple when we worship you. Oh, we worship you, holy. So holy is the Lord, holy is the Lord Almighty, seated on the throne. He's seated on the throne of glory, high and lifted up. Your presence fills the temple when we worship you. have a gift, quickly come. I'm going to ask my pastors and ministers to come. Stand here with me, Pastor Colleen, join me. People are still coming. We're going to give this to the Lord. We love His bride. <laughs> you know, last Sunday when Pastor Cal was it last Sunday? Sunday before last, when Pastor Cal on Sunday night surprised us with a painting. Amazing. It's amazing. And he came out with the painting for Colleen and I. You know, we were shocked. And then he comes out with a painting for my wife. I'm going to tell you why it didn't matter how much I was going to get that painting for my wife. So out of my mouth came this $10,000. Nobody outbid me, so I got it. Amen. <laughs> you say, why would you do it? Because I love my wife. And that painting's in my office. Oh, wow. And I look at that and I go, wow. She's beautiful. How'd she marry me? Must have been a miracle. I love my bride. And I love his church. I love this church. It's God's bride. We're going to give. We're going to continue to give. And I'll tell you what. God's going to do great things. Reach your hands out. Father, we lift this offering to you today. For all those who gave last Sunday and this Sunday and this special time of giving, we're asking you, Holy Ghost, to come and bless your people this year. Lord, we thank you for what happened on Easter, what's now happening on Pentecost, and what will happen at the Feast of Tabernacles in October. You are allowing us the moment to stretch and say, Lord, we love you, 
And we love what's on your heart, your church. So bless your people, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Oh, give praise to the Lord. Now, tonight's going to be a powerful night. You don't want to miss Pastor Denny's ministry. He's going to be preaching, I believe, on the Holy Spirit. It's going to be powerful. You want to be here. Is this the room? Somebody say, yes, it is. Is this the room? You don't want to miss it. Now, secondly, a friend of mine bought uh, about 500 uh, COVID test kits to give to our people. If you would want one of those COVID test kits, you call the office, ask for Pastor Glenn. And if you need it for your family, it's free. Say it's free. Now, it didn't cost him. He had to pay for it, but it's free for us. Now, <clears throat> also, if you gave your heart to the Lord or renewed your faith today, prayed that prayer and really meant it, stop by the next steps table and let them know so they can give you some material to grow in God. Is that all right? And uh, looking forward to seeing you tonight. It's going to be great. Are you ready to be blessed? Are you sure? Lift your hands. Let me bless you. Final thing you did on planet Earth, Lord. As you were ascending, you lifted your hands and you blessed your disciples. And you told me every Sunday morning I was to do the same, so I blessed them. Bless them in the city, bless them in the field, bless them on their jobs and in their homes. May your face shine upon them and give them peace. May they be the head and not the tail, the lender, not the borrower, above and up and beneath. May they prosper and be in health as their soul prospers. May your loving kindness and tender mercy surround them. Everywhere they go, may they find favor. <clears throat> Put them in the right place at the right time for divine appointments. Give them supernatural wisdom to make right decisions. Lord, I declare today that your angelic host will protect them. No evil will come nigh their dwelling. They'll walk in your spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. They'll put on your full armor. They'll stand strong. They'll advance your kingdom. Lord, I pray you fill them full of faith. I declare it over them. Mountains will be moved. Lord, their children will rise up and call them blessed. And they'll be a blessing. We declare it done. In the mighty name of Jesus and all in agreement said, Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tonight. Your comes